Well, it's indeed a great pleasure to be here and to present this lecture. I, uh, it's uh, not easy to listen to this because this is uh, the menu for today. And so in one hour or hopefully a bit less, I have to explain all these things to you. What a neutrino is, what neutrino astronomy is, ice cube, it's the first telescope, and then I will tell you a little bit about our recent results. And uh, it's a good time to be here because uh, we ran the detector for 10 years and uh, you know, we discovered, as Mario said, cosmic neutrinos. But it's only after 10 years, with the advent of machine learning, that suddenly all the results popped out of the data. And so I hope to bring you this excitement at the end of the lecture. Uh, OK, so a neutrino, I mean, even if you know what a neutrino is, you, you may be not What's it doing in our universe? Well, you learned in school that the universe is made out of protons, neutrons that make nuclei, and then there are uh, electrons, and when you put the electrons around the nuclei, you have atoms. Well, that's not completely true, because in the 1920s, 100 years ago, People were doing experiments in Cambridge and they noticed that the neutron can change itself in a proton and an electron. But when they measured this configuration, they noticed if I have the neutron, that occasionally the proton and the electron would go in the same direction. Now that violates energy and momentum conservation. So there must be a particle that goes that way. That was normal to us, but to them, I mean, they, they didn't know what this actually meant. And it was an Austrian uh, theorist who proposed in 1930 that there is a particle called the neutrino that goes in the other direction. And so either you violate momentum conservation or you believe there is a neutrino. Also, you realize that without a neutrino, you cannot change neutrons into protons. Changing neutrons into protons is nuclear physics. So the neutrino is kind of the agent that makes nuclear physics possible. There is no nuclear physics without neutrinos. So Ellis and Mott in 1933 actually carefully measured where that the neutrino, where it came out in the, in the detector, and they could actually establish that it had a very low mass. And so some people even speculated that it may not exist, it was just some mathematical quantity. But in fact, nowadays, this is how we discover particles. It's called the missing energy measurement and particles are discovered. But in 1933, they couldn't imagine, you know, there were three particles, they couldn't imagine they discovered another one. So the conclusion is that this is what matter is made of. And of all these particles, actually, the most common one in the universe is the neutrino. Uh, the neutrino is everywhere where there's nuclear physics. They were created in the Big Bang. Without neutrinos, there's no fusion. The sun doesn't work. Uh, when stars explode, neutrinos play a fundamental role in exploding stars, producing the material that you and I are made of. Uh, of course, you produce, at accelerators, you produce neutrinos. You emit neutrinos. The salt in your body decays in neutrinos in large numbers, actually. The Earth emits neutrinos, but the top right in yellow there, that's a very important uh, uh, box. You see, uh, you see the, the blue light, this is a reactor, and you see this in textbooks, right? You see a nuclear reactor, it's covered with water to shield it, and the water is blue. That's the method we are using. 
the water is not colored blue. It are particles coming out of the reactor that emit blue light when they go to the water. And that's the principle we are going to use to build a neutrino telescope. So this is all good news. The bad news is this. In fact, uh, cosmic rays that Mario mentioned, which are uh, protons, I will talk mixed protons, they are mostly protons, but they are all heavier nuclei. Uh, they fill the universe, they hit the atmosphere, and they produce neutrinos. And so they, they enter the atmosphere, interact with nitrogen or oxygen, and they make particles like at CERN. They make pions, and pions decay into muons, and the muons decay in neutrino. And uh, the pion also produces with the muon uh, two muon neutrinos. Now, why do I tell you this? Well, that's bad news for my next subject, which is neutrino astronomy. Because that means if you look up at the sky, there's the atmosphere, and the atmosphere produces neutrinos. So it's like you're trying to use a telescope at night, but there are clouds. In this case, the clouds never go away, though. You cannot wait for the clear sky. So that is one of the challenges of neutrino astronomy. Uh, you will be hear more about this later. So what's astronomy? I'm a physicist, so I don't know much astronomy. Uh, this, I know when you go out at night, uh, this is what the sky looks like, not in Lisbon probably, but you can see, so I will always, when you see an ellipse like that, it's a projection that shows what arises from the universe. And so when you look here, the large, uh, the major axis of the ellipse is, uh, is the Milky Way. So that's normal. You see your, the stars in your own galaxy first. And then if you look far away at the rest of the map, you see galaxies far away. But it's simple geometry. You're supposed to first see what's in your own galaxy, the stars in your own galaxy. And the sum of the rest of the universe is less bright than your own galaxy. And you, that's what we call the Milky Way. Now, it has a, been a successful enterprise in astronomy to change the color of the light. You know, there's visible light, our eyes detect. But if you go, for instance, to red light, the universe you see at some point is like this. It's totally different. So when you s change the color of the light, you see new versions of the universe and you learn things. And you detect things that were not there before. And things that were there before look different. So this has been very useful. So uh, I will talk about this in terms of energy or wavelength sometimes. And so these are uh, typical atomic uh, electron energy, uh, photon energies. And so this is the microwave background. What you are looking at is a picture of the sky in terms of microwave photons. And you know there are 411 per cubic centimeter. They will play a big role in this talk. Then if I go to blue, that's, for instance, when the photon energy is 1 GeV. And you see that's the sky. You see the Milky Way again in 1 GeV photons. And uh, then you see, if you look farther away, you see other galaxies in the rest of the ellipse. But the Milky Way stands out. Uh, now, what people try to do is go to smaller and smaller wavelengths to higher, higher photon energies. And what happens when you do that? The star, that's what you see. Nothing. The, the sky turns dark. That's where we are going to use neutrinos. This sky has never been seen before. So what's the reason? It's very simple. You have, uh, suppose you produce a photon very far away 
with this very, very small wavelength or this very high energy, and it's emitted by a galaxy, at some point it will meet a microwave photon, one of the 411 per cubic centimeter that are in this room and in the whole universe. And then it becomes an E plus and an E minus pair. That's physics, that's well known. But that's a problem because once you have charged particles, you cannot do astronomy. Charged particles, they are bent by magnetic fields in the universe. And when they enter our own galaxy before they reach your telescope, they are bent by the magnetic field in our own galaxy. So they kind of forget where they come from. And so if they forget where they come from, you cannot look back and you cannot do astronomy. In fact, this is another way of looking at this. This is, uh, this, I know this is a complicated slide, but what I plot on the left axis is the energy reaching us from the universe in this particular wavelength. And you see, this is the sky seen in gray. This is the energy we receive from the universe in radio waves. That peak there, C and B, that's the microwave background. Those, that's the most energy is in microwave photons in our universe. Then you go to red light, visible light, X-rays, and eventually gamma rays. This is the last map I showed you. This is the energy reaching us in gamma rays. And you see, oops, it's finished. And that's what I just explained in the previous slide. That's when the universe turns dark. There is no energy, no wavelength of photon that allows you to look to the right of this blue arrow. And so the logic of neutrino astronomy is to look at this sky in neutrinos. And uh, so what about a neutrino? I told you already, I mean, in Cambridge they couldn't detect it. And in fact, very hard to detect. I, quote, I quoted Pauli. Pauli said, I've discovered a particle that cannot be detected. So it's a philosophical discussion whether it's real or not. He wasn't quite right, as you will see in a minute. But it has an advantage. If you can detect neutrinos, you see the whole sky, even the dark part in my previous slide. You not only see the sc whole sky, remember, the universe exists for a long time. So you also see the universe back to the beginning of time. You see everything because neutrinos uh, cannot be stopped. And so this is another way of looking at it. You see, these are the wavelengths I showed you before from microwave, optical, X-ray, gamma rays. So there the sky, we can only see neutrinos. And of course, this goes on forever. Uh, although it's getting into the dark region is challenging, as I will show you in a minute. However, we know something exists there. And that's what Mario and company are measuring in Argentina. The sky emits, it's full of cosmic rays. It emits cosmic rays at these energies, but they are charged particles. So you, it's difficult to do astronomy with them. They're trying, but it has been challenging. Uh, so the next question is, is there something there that's interesting? Yes, of course. It's the dark universe that produces these cosmic rays. And I got, I was always in my career, even when I was a particle physicist, I was interested in, in uh, neutrino, in, in cosmic rays and neutrino astronomy. But I remember a very modest experiment in 91 discovered a, a particle that had 300 million TV energy. Now, so TV will be my unit from now on. This stands for tera electron volt. Electron volt is photons emitted by atoms. Tera means 10 to the 12. Uh, you can think of it also, the, the accelerator at CERN accelerate protons up to 14 TV. 
So this is 300 million. How can you not spend the rest of your life trying to figure out where this, pa this particle came from, if you are a particle theorist even? And uh, so if you use LHC magnets and fill the orbit of Mercury, then you would accelerate this particle. This is not how nature does it. I can say this with confidence. <laughs> now, okay, so you want to do neutrino astronomy. We have learned that neutrinos interact a little bit. And so we know uh, from the standard model of particle physics, we know how often neutrinos interact. And for about two decades, theorists, including myself, try to estimate how big a, a telescope you needed. And the consensus was if you build a one kilometer square neutrino mirror, you could probably catch cosmic neutrinos. But nobody knew. It was a pure shot in the dark, literally, in this case. So we know how to build uh, neutrino detectors. You need water and light sensors. These are light bulbs. They are about that big. And instead of putting electricity in and light coming out, you put light in and you produce electricity. So you can detect photons, you can detect light uh, that's produced in this water. And uh, that's important. The problem is the estimate of needing one kilometer square means that this detector in the Japanese Alps is 10,000 times too small. Well, then you build one 10,000 times bigger. And the basic idea of how to do this was due to Markov already in 1960. He wasn't thinking of one, one kilometer square uh, neutrino mirrors, but he had the following idea. So how do you detect neutrinos? First of all, you don't look up. Remember the atmosphere, you look through the Earth. And the only particle we know that comes through the Earth is the neutrino. So the neutrino comes through the Earth. What does it do? Here is, he proposed to build a detector putting these uh, light bulbs, these light sensors, deep in the ocean or in Lake Baikal, which they're actually still doing. And uh, so this neutrino will just fly through your detector. About one in a million times, it will accidentally just hit a nucleus of uh, hydrogen or oxygen in, in the water. And then it will make a spray of particles. You get a nuclear interaction. And just like the picture of the water above uh, the nuclear reactor, when it makes a nuclear reaction, the waters turn blue. So it, the neutri neutrino disappeared, and the spray of particles coming out makes a, a flash of blue light. And among this flash, if this is a muon neutrino, the, there are three types of neutrinos, not very important. Uh, the muon neutrino produces occasionally a muon. And that muon can travel for a long time and go through your detector. So what you are using here is that particle, the neutrino produced, uh, it can travel for a kilometer, up to 10 kilometers through the water. And the speed of light in the water is three quarters of the speed of light at which this muon is traveling. This neutrino we are looking at, remember, has very high energy. So the muon has high energy. And uh, so the light it produces is going to leave it behind. It's like a speedboat. It go, that goes faster than the waves, so the waves form a shock front. And so if you can measure with your light bulbs, your light sensors, the shape of that light front, then you not only detect a muon, you detect the direction it came from in the sky. And you have a telescope. 
So you have a neutrino detector, but it's also a telescope because you can reconstruct this muon's direction. So here is the picture. So this is uh, ice cube, actually. I'll come to it later. Uh, you cannot see very well, but on these vertical lines, there are 60 dots. And each of these dots is a light sensor, 10 inches. So it's a bit smaller than in the Japanese detector. In fact, half the diameter. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, in a pressure vessel. It has electronics, etc., etc. But you see the picture here. A neutrino came in. It interacted. It produced a spray of light, which we don't see. We only see the muon going at a speed of light through the, close to the speed of light through the detector. And you see the light it emits lights up all these sensors. And you can see by eye where this neutrino comes from. So even if I don't draw it, here you see that's the real data actually you're looking at. It's not. And you, you can see for yourself where this neutrino came from, right? We can do this to 0 0.3 degrees. For that, you need a computer. <laughs> uh, so this was tried in the 1970s by uh, a group from the University of Hawaii lowering light bulbs uh, like the ones I, I showed earlier, in pressure vessels into the ocean. And around the time at Wisconsin, we were thinking about uh, how to do neutrino astronomy. Uh, we were thinking about all kinds of things, uh, uh, mostly radio detection, actually. But then we saw this experiment fail. And so that's when the idea came up in the late 80s at Wisconsin, can we do this in a different way? And so I, uh, the idea was simply do the same thing, but do it in ice. And this was a crazy idea. But uh, the reason we thought about ice was that the, we thought it actually may be simpler to put uh, detectors deep in the ice than in ocean water, which is ocean water is a challenging environment. And this is kind of not intuitive, but history has proven us right. Uh, this is Antarctica. And you see uh, the left is ice above water. On the right hand side, the ice is on solid rock. And there in the middle, where you see this cutout, that's the South Pole. And at the South Pole, you stand on three kilometers of solid ice. That's where we are going to build the detector. So at the South Pole, I mean, the, the success of this experiment is uh, a whole series of coincidences. At the South Pole, the National Science Foundation happens to have a base where it's the infrastructure that allows you to build a rather sophisticated experiment if you don't make things t too difficult. And you see that's on the left, that's the South Pole Station. You see the runway where the planes land. And on the right, you see ice cube construction. And uh, so the way this works, you build the experiment, the the components of the experiment in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin. Then it goes by boat or by flight, mostly by boat, to New Zealand, where there is a logistics center at Christchurch Airport. From there, it's a nine hour flight to McMurdo Base on the coast of Antarctica. And then here, it's another three hour flight to the South Pole. The South Pole looks like this. It's a desert. There's nothing. No vegetation, no animals. It's a total desert. But it's three kilometers of ice. And uh, we made this fantastic discovery that uh, 
the eyes actually, of course you realize to build this detector you have to understand the optics of the eyes. You're going to build a Cherenkov detector as physicists call the light. If the light travels through the eyes one meter you cannot do this because you want to build a kilometer cube detector and how far the light travels determine how many of the sensors you need. And the sensors are expensive, but mostly putting them in the eyes is expensive. So, here is the station. So, uh, you have a rather decent infrastructure to actually uh, support the experiment. And the station is actually available, accessible, not accessible, is avail available uh, 12 months through the year. So two people st stay there with this experiment through the polar, through the Antarctic winter. So of course that's, a, you don't want, you want to operate year round, right? So I already said this, I cannot show, so if you think of this as the ice shelf at the South Pole, if you go 1300 meters deep, the bubbles disappear in the ice. And there the ice has an absorption length for blue light, the light I, you saw in the previous slides, that goes from 100 to 300 meters actually. You cannot build a material in the lab that, that's transparent. And what's the reason? It's 50,000 year old snow that's condensed, that fell on Antarctica 50,000 years ago. It's ultra pure. And the purity determines the wavelength of the light. Okay, so we started doing this experiment. I like to show this picture because if you think, you know, enterprises like Ice Cube, you go and ask for a lot of money and uh, go to industry for help, but non none of that. This was the start of the experiment. I was a theorist. So the only way I could get a lab is to, uh, to remove the ping pong table on which we played at lunch. And that was not a very popular move, I can tell you. And so uh, this was the group. Uh, Three students, one undergraduate, a tall one, my colleague Bob Morse, who now lives retired, and Serap Tilaf, who was a postdoc at the time, who's now a professor at the University of Delaware. And so you see here the first sensors we built, and they all worked. Uh, this, by the way, is what we are using at the time, eight inch photomultiplier, you buy them in Japan, for about a thousand dollars. That's the cheap part of the experiment and the easy part. Uh, so then you would have to find a way to put them deep in the ice, which we did. I'll come back to that in a minute. And so in the, by the year 2000, we had built an experiment that started below the bubbles in the ice at 1500 meters. By the way, if there are bubbles, the light scatters and you just get confused, right? You realize that. So it was, uh, it contained about 650 of these sensors. And the important thing, and I must say, this was for me the most exciting part of this whole experiment. This is again the online display. It looks, this was, this R&D experiment was called Amanda. And we actually detected neutrinos. These are not cosmic neutrinos, these are neutrinos made in the atmosphere on the other side of the Earth. But just the fact that the technique worked was uh, incredibly exciting. And as I told you, we need a kilometer cube detector, but now we had shown this work, we were going to build a kilometer cube detector. I must tell you, it's not always as easy as I describe it, and this is not me. <laughs> How do you now build the experiment? Well, just I'll tell you. Uh, you publish in Nature or Science. And uh, you make wild claims that you know how to build a kilometer cube detector. In fact, 
we not only made the claim, we gave the price, and if you adjust for inflation, it was exactly the right number. Uh, but then you need help, so um, we were very popular. The economists wrote the whole article on, on this experiment, and that helps, of course. And then the Scientific American made, uh, declared the seven wonders of modern astronomy. And so you see at the bottom, number seven is us. And the category was the weirdest detector. And we were in a category by ourselves. But uh, we could sell this story and we started production of ice cube. We built a kilometer cube detector. Now that's not built in the ping pong room anymore. <laughs> And so that's when, uh, you know, management, organization, budgets come in. But the idea was the same. You put now 5,000, more than 5,000 photomultipliers in a kilometer cube volume. And so a neutrino sees this as a kilometer square mirror. So if you could go in the detector, there would be a cable with, uh, because you have to supply current to, to your modules, to your sensors. So there would be a cable, and the cable uh, would contain 60 modules, 17 meters apart. And when you look 125 meters away, there is another cable. And so on an hexagonal grid, if you have 86 of these, what we call strings, then you fill a kilometer cube with sensors. In this case, 10 inch, as you saw on the previous picture. Now, from now on, all the questions are how do you put, you know, light sensors in ice? And so I'm going to avoid all questions by just showing you a movie. The top 80, 90 meters is snow, so you just melt it. Then you pull out this heat probe, and then comes what we call the, uh, the hot water drill. So this is a nozzle that, like a garden hose, pushes hot water under pressure, and it actually falls by gravity. And after two days, it has transformed, there's no hole, it has transformed ice into water over two and a half kilometers. That takes a 4.8 megawatt water uh, 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 heater. And so this is just a collection, I'll come back to this at the end, of car wash heaters that produce the heat, about 40 of them. Here you see uh, the drill, the hot water drill is uh, like a circus train but built on sleds instead of wheels. This is a two and a half kilometer hose, one hose in one shot down to two and a half kilometers. These are the heaters producing the 4.8 megawatts by normal fuel that's brought in by, by plane. At the end, we could build one hole for less than one cargo flight of fuel. And so, still expensive, but possible. So here you see the hot water drill comes out and then the whole circus train moves to under 25 meters away. But ice is an insulator, so after you pull the drill out, that water stays liquid for about a day. Uh, and so you have all the sensors ready, and so the cable goes down. Every 17 meters you attach a light sensor, that's the electrical cable bringing down the voltage to the sensors. And once the last one, you let it sink into the hole. And so you have instrument at the bottom one kilometer of this two and a half kilometer hole. So here again, uh, 4.8 megawatt heating plant. They're just uh, car wash heaters, a bit souped up. And uh, so you produce 200 gallons per minute uh, uh, of boiling water. And so the important thing is 
the crew did this 86 times without failing. And so this is an efficient method to build a detector. And once you deliver the detector, it's completely stable. In 10 years, we have lost five of the 5,160 modules. Uh, there's actually an argument whether it's five or four. But, <laughs> but this is a picture you see in one summer, December, January in the South Pole, you have drilled 20 holes, you see the cables, they come into this, count, into this two story building and you can see what's in this building is computers. And so what these computers do, they, con they collect all the light signals and make Cherenkov comes out of them and that's how you know the direction of your event. It's a bit more complicated, but it's okay. That's the idea. Uh, I'll show you what IceCube sees. You turn the detector on. Uh, remember, what we're seeing is neutrinos and muons produced in the atmosphere everywhere on Earth. And uh, here you go. You see? You see these light signals come in and then the computers just reconstruct the direction of the muons. And uh, you see the movie repeats. You see here a bundle of muons going through the detector at some point. And Mario knows what that is. <laughs> so this movie shows 10 milliseconds of data. So what it means is muons produced in the atmosphere, we detect 100 billion, 3,000 every second. We detect a neutrino every five minutes, more like four minutes now. That means 100,000 per year. But these are produced in the atmosphere. The question is, how many cosmic neutrinos are we going to detect? And around this point that the detector was complete, science, the new scientist, which was a respectable English magazine, uh, published this web page. And you could actually literally bet on this page. And it shows you what the odds are that big uh, experiments will actually detect what they are looking for. And you see uh, Amanda, if they still called it Amanda, although it was Ice Cube, we got six to one odds. You can imagine after 20 years of work, this was rather depressing. <laughs> and, uh, but Atlas got also six to one for seeing the Higgs boson. And LIGO got only 500 to one for detecting gravitational waves. You see, we have been incredibly lucky. All these things have been discovered by now. And actually, uh, new scientists took down the web page uh, before we could really bet on it. Uh, so I was never really worried. I thought, if you build something this unusual, you will do something interesting. The surprise to me is that we actually did neutrino astronomy. You know, I'm a particle physicist, kind of. Yeah. So. We were looking for something that's called Kreisen, Zatsep, and Kuzmin neutrinos. They are kind of uh, light uh, patterns that will light up the whole detector. And that's easy. That's what we looked for first. Even a theorist can do that data analysis. And so we didn't find any. But we found this event, totally serendipitously. And where is the muon track? Where is the Cherenkov cone? It's not there. Well, there are also electron and muon neutrinos. There are three types of neutrinos. So we didn't see what we were looking for, but we discovered an electron neutrino. And what's great about this neutrino is, you see the whole energy is contained in the detector. We know exactly what the energy is. And in fact, in this case, the energy is 1,000 TeV. And the atmosphere cannot 
really produce or doesn't very often produce a neutrino of a thousand TeV. So we discovered two of them. And what do you do? Well, you don't do anything. You publish this event and say, look, we have a thousand TeV electron neutrino. But then we looked, by the way, this is a spectacular thing, right? Because, uh, so you see, the mod this is the lake uh, near the campus of the University of Wisconsin and the data center is uh, close to the center of the city and I have, I have superimposed the event on the, on the campus. So in Lisbon the event would go for about six city blocks and you have a lot of information, 100,000 photons over six city blocks and you know where each of them is to two nanoseconds which is about that much. So what did we do? We took our first two years of data and looked for these events and we found 26 more. And you see here we published them and uh, in November of 2013 and uh, you know, we, were, we claimed discovery of cosmic neutrinos, but we were rather nervous about this. Uh, two weeks later, we were, uh, sorry, two weeks later, we were dis declared the discovery of the year. And I didn't sleep very well for many nights, I can tell you. Uh, there was still this, uh, strange feeling that it could be charm particles that make these events of so something we know now is not true but uh, okay uh, discovery is not always exciting it can be different but we were supposed to discover cosmic neutrinos with muons and so what happened to that of course, we were all doing what I just explained, but somewhere in some office there was a graduate student still doing what Markov told us to do. And uh, we only beat him by three months. He also discovered cosmic neutrinos. And this is the latest version of this detection. What you see here, uh, don't look at too, much de too many details, you see the, the muon tracks we detect as a function of their energy. And you see in the beginning here, you see the threshold of the detector. Then as the muons get larger energy, the, we detect more and more events. And then when the energy gets very high, the above TeV in this case, the universe, the, atmosphere cannot produce muons anymore and so then you follow the flux made in the atmosphere and you see here when you reach this point suddenly the atmospheric flux cannot explain the data anymore and so this little tale was the discovery the way Markov originally suggests that we should make the discovery. So we had now two different ways to detect cosmic neutrinos and they actually perfectly agreed. They gave the same numbers for uh, the flux that we were seeing from the universe. So there were two surprises, however. By the way, this is uh, one year of data. If I plot 10 years of data, you cannot, it just, the resolution isn't good enough. So under 38,000 neutrinos in a year. And we now know from these two measurements, in this plot there are 200 cosmic neutrinos, maybe 250, we're not sure, there's an error on this. Good luck to find them, right? Uh, but we did. You know, if you take the one that just stick out, that have high enough energy not to be atmospheric, and you plot them, then you can see a map of the universe in neutrinos. So this is the first time we see this dark region I was talking about in the beginning. And what do you notice? And we actually didn't really pay much attention to this until later. You don't see the, our own galaxy. 
So all these neutrinos, or most of them, come from other galaxies. This is, as I said, geom this defies geometry. You're first supposed to see neutrino stars in your own galaxy. And that was the first problem. Remember, this is what the sky looks like in light. The second problem was, as uh, the cosmic ray physicists can relate to, when you talk to astronomers, and you're doing cosmic ray physics, God forbid neutrino astronomy, uh, they think this is some kind of boutique science that's really not important to understand the universe. Well, they were very wrong. Remember, here is the neutrino sky. This is uh, the universe in photons, the energy reaching us in photons. Of course, it cuts off, as I explained, because the flux doesn't get through the microwave background. And you see our two neutrino measurements are actually exceeding the photon flux, the astronomer's flux. So not only is it not boutique science, no, the energy neutrinos dominates, and cosmic rays, by implication, dominates this dark universe. So that were two surprising results. So I've so the opportunity to do astronomy now is, is of course fantastic. Still not easy, as you will see. I think I said all this. So where do they come from? And this was not easy. After 10 years, this was a map of, of the neutrino sky. In fact, you cannot plot the neutrinos. What you are looking at is the probability of in a certain place in the universe, see a concentration of neutrinos with high energy, which is by definition that sticks out over this uniform background made by the atmosphere. And so we found after 10 years that the hottest spot was an active galaxy, another galaxy, NGC 1068, you know, the, 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 this telephone number is the catalogue where you can find uh, this, this galaxy. It's, uh, and we, disco we discover it at 2.9 sigma. Now, 3 sigma is supposed to be evidence. So this was, we are not quite there yet. So what do you do? You have 10 years of data. You cannot do anything by you know, taking data another 10 years, that's too slow, especially when you're my age. And uh, so what we did is we, I'm not going to explain this slide, but we did everything that you could do. We recalibrated the detector. We analyzed the data, optical module by optical module. You know, each optical module, we knew exactly where its position is, how it's oriented in the eyes, and what is, uh, for the experts, a detailed one photoelectron peak is. And so we ended up with a better detector. And we had kept all our data on tapes and on disk for 10 years. So we could run the improvement, not just for future data, but through our past 10 years of data. Then uh, we were partially blind because the point spread function of the telescope, how well it points, we were approximating by Gaussians. We knew this was wrong. And we did very detailed Monte Carlo simulation to correct that. Then we did a whole analysis, selecting the events, reconstructing the energy and the direction by uh, machine learning techniques, which became fantastic. And uh, they also, they require very little computing time, which was crucial. And here is the map again. And we see NGC 1068 again. And uh, we also see it 
in a list of 110 sources which we pre-selected and looked at and we find again this galaxy and in fact its uh, enhancement is 5.2 sigma so we went from 2.9 to 5.2 sigma and uh, because we do the analysis in a way that we can actually count all our trials this happened accidentally happens less than one in 400,000 trials so I mean this is a real source uh, what's an active galaxy this is a picture of this galaxy and we are looking at the very inside of the galaxy an active galaxy is a galaxy unlike ours that where the black hole is active it's absorbing all the stars, the gases, the photons, everything that's in the galaxy is slowly absorbed. It's cannibalizing its own, its own galaxy. Fortunately, our galaxy, the black hole, is dead. It's not doing that. And, uh, but in this galaxy, it is. And you see uh, on the plot here, you see an excess. The, the red is the atmospheric background and uh, you see in the direction of the galaxy you, we have 80 events. We then tried some other techniques, we tried to look for sources that uh, emit a lot of x-rays, I won't go into details why, and we found another galaxy, NGC 4151, and this is amusing, I like to mention it, because when Carl Seifert in 1943 uh, discovered these galaxies, they were the first two sources on his list as well. So history completely repeats itself in neutrinos. So here is the active galaxy, the way you find there is a rotating supermassive black hole at the center, and then there is this jet of particles that comes out with high energy, and as particle physicists, we were totally fooled by this jet and couldn't understand our data. In fact, we think this jet has nothing to do with what we're seeing. The action is right at the center, close to the black hole. That's where the neutrinos are produced. And that's what you need to understand the 80 neutrinos and also the other information that the astronomers provide us. And so this is close to the black hole. In fact, the neutrinos originate within about 10 Schwarzschild radii. Now, if you don't know what a Schwarzschild radii is, it doesn't matter. It's very close. In fact, remember this picture of the black hole? This is one and a half Schwarzschild radii, and this is very difficult to get there. So, Unfortunately, we found our neutrinos coming from a region that's very difficult to access. But for the particle physicist in the audience, this is what you expect, right? Because you have an accelerator, particles falling in the black hole, there's also acceleration on the accretion disk, and then all this acceleration is happening in this very dense region around this black hole, so you have a target to produce neutrinos. Uh, this was for the experts, I, sorry. So then we started surfacing this map and you asked the question, how, do, how strong are, if I ask for two sources, or ask for three sources, four sources, what do you find? And the most, the highest significance is for three sources, and it are these three sources. You see again NGC, the, uh, the strongest one. The second strongest is this PKS4. They're all active galaxies. But one, TXS0506, that was very exciting because we had discovered that one in 2017. And what we did in 2017 was we decided, as we couldn't find the sources, to, whenever we detected a neutrino, and we were relatively sure it was a cosmic neutrino, means it had high energy, we reconstructed it with the computers at the pole, 
And normally you send the data to Madison, reanalyze it and then send it to the collaboration and eventually to the rest of the world. But we just took the reconstructions at the pole and sent them by telephone to all the astronomers in the world who, who were interested. So within less than a minute you could know where a neutrino came from within less than a minute when it passed through the ice at the South Pole. And so in September of 2017 we found this neutrino. You now can relate to what is this, right? Uh, and it came right from an active galaxy, which astronomers call the blazar because it has a jet, which has confused us for a while. But, uh, and this blazar was actually in a very active state. The black hole was, uh, you know, producing an incredible light show. And uh, it was then discovered by the telesc a telescope called MAGIC in uh, La Palma that it was actually emitting TV neutrinos, which is very rare. And so at some point, we didn't know whether astronomers looked at these neutrinos. At some point, more than 20 telescopes were looking at this event at the dire direction where it came from. And in fact, the most significant, the 50 sigma, association of the neutrino with this galaxy was obtained by an optical telescope in Russia that was looking at it after 73 seconds. So, uh, but now we found it again in our map. So if you want to read about this, of course, we're very proud of these two publications in science. The second publication is, this is uh, September 2017, now we looked at this particular case, place in our data and we realized that in 2014 it made a burst of neutrinos that was even bigger than the burst we were looking at in 2017. We knew about this, but the number of trials in a, in a map is too large to claim this. But now that you can look at one spot, of course, there it is. And uh, to finish this lecture, where is the galactic plane? Well, the last few months we found that one too. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, this is a nice place to conclude. So this is the South Pole and superimposed on the Milky Way, the red, are the neutrinos emitted by the galactic plane. It is there, but it's kind of there at the 10% level. Other galaxies dominate. So my guess is, now I could take bets, right? Why is all this? My bet is that we don't have an active black hole. So the other galaxies that have active black holes make most of this flux. We don't have a black hole, so we are su su seeing something subdominant, and we actually know what it is. It are cosmic rays interacting with the material in the galaxy and producing neutrinos. And so I think this is a nice place to stop. Uh, so have we discovered the sources of cosmic rays? It's the beginning. Cosmic ray physics is never this simple. But I think to have convinced you, this was the man who discovered cosmic rays. That's more than a hundred years ago. I think it's a hundred, well, you can work out. It was in, in 1912, this picture. And so I think to have convinced us that we have the tools to solve the problem where cosmic rays come from, with multi-messenger astronomy, with, cosmic, with the big cosmic ray, facilities, the gamma ray facilities, and maybe even by ourselves. We will see, probably both. Thank you very much. <laughs>